Well, Jess, welcome. And thank you so much for joining me on Instagram for this live today. I'm Absolutely. such a fan of you and such a fan of your work. <laughs> thank you. The feeling is absolutely mutual. Oh, thank you. You're, you're truly one of my inspirations. And um, oh my goodness. And here you are taking out all your cute little treasures. <gasps> yes. The treasures oh. that you invented. Oh my so goodness. I, I love your little washi tape. Thank you. I realized with these two, I need to find a way to keep them apart. Because one's the adventure set. Mm -hmm. and the other is the sequel set. Oh, and so they don't have any overlaps, but from the outside, I can't tell them apart. So I've, yeah, plus I think it's so fun to customize your supplies in different ways, make them completely you, even if it's just the outside. I think it really adds a lot to the experience of painting. Oh, and they look wonderful. They look wonderful. Um, well, just I was wondering, maybe we should give people a little overview of maybe how we know each other, because it's actually been some years now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, and I guess I'll just share that when I was pregnant with my daughter, you were working at a store in Bellingham, not far from my home in um, Seattle. And we actually didn't get the chance to meet in person, but you invited me to do an art show. Um, and it yes, was the last was art show I did. I was getting married right then and you were having your baby. <laughs> oh, it was so fun. It was my last show before I had Stella. And, um, and I think it's fun now that we're both now mothers of young children. And, and how old is Aurora? She is just over a year and a half now. That is such a fun age and busy age too, huh? <laughs> yes, it is. We're potty training. Yeah, yeah. And my Stella is um, four and three quarters, I guess now. Sometimes oh, feels wow. like going on 15. <laughs> I can't believe it's been that long. I know, I know. Uh, well, gosh, Jess, I, would you want to start off um, by just sharing, I, I love that you're pulling out your palette, some of your other tools, and I was hoping you might be able to share some of your process and background of making handmade watercolors, because it's, it's such a cool thing you do, and your every palette I feel like that you make is just like this treasure box full of <laughs> basically these like little jewels of your colors and sometimes they're full of surprises and kind of you know behave differently and so would you think you could just share a little bit about coming to to making paints and a little bit about your process and tools sure um we started making paint i didn't even know how many years ago now but basically living up in the pacific northwest i was really into backpacking and Matt and I would go rock climbing together a lot on the weekends and I was looking for a way to blend my painting practice with my love for the outdoors and mm -hmm. so I'd gotten really into oil painting and learning about pigments and just my process has always been that I love kind of building things from the ground up kind of reverse engineering, what are these things made of, making sure I'm using the absolute best ingredients. And so I, I'd watercolored a lot growing up, taken private lessons, carried a watercolor set across Europe. And so it just kind of all came together with watercolor is amazing because it's a medium that you can carry literally anywhere, especially when the palettes are the size of a business card. And so you can be literally on the summit of a mountain with artist grade supplies selling work that you can sell in a gallery. There's absolutely no compromises when you're using watercolor. So another factor that really pulled me into it was using natural pigments. And so you can see like, this is malachite here. It's a genuine malachite. And since we're a small company and we make micro batches by hand, we don't have a lot of the other kind of trade-offs to face that larger companies do like competitive price points. So we don't have to make compromises on how much pigment we put into each pan. We can put as much as we want and we'll just price it accordingly. And so sometimes they're very expensive colors like malachite is a little bit more expensive. But so beautiful. <laughs> Yes. It's, and it's so fun to paint with the real thing. There's, that's one of the magic things about pigments is that it's not an approximation. It's not a mixture. It's like, it's 
actually malachite that you're painting with. So basically, when you say it. actually malachite, it's like the ground up mineral, ground really fine. And then you guys are like hand mixing it with some other binders to make the paint. Exactly. So you, the process we use is the traditional method that watercolor started out being made from hundreds of years ago. So you use a molar slab, so it's a lot like a mortar and a pestle. And since I'm at the home studio in quarantine right now, I don't have a mortar and pestle that I can quite show you. But, um, or not mortar and pestle, <laughs> molar and slab. So mortar and pestle is kind of the similar concept. So if any of you have ever cooked, you've probably used a mortar and pestle in a kitchen. A molar and slab, it's the same thing, but flat. And so what it does is there is a kind of friction and very specific physical state that's created between the molar and then the slab so that literally each piece of pigment, each pigment particle is coated individually with a binder. It's why using a palette knife to mix up your paints is not the same as using a molar and a slab. And it's also why ball grinders, which are the more industrialized version are not quite the same thing. So it's really a by hand process of making these. Exactly, very labor intensive, but I really love making tedious things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, really you, have, uh -huh. you, you have, like, I feel like I see on your feed just all of these like treasures. You've got this eye for finding beautiful things. So is that like an old cigar box or something there or? This is just an old vintage tin that my sister bought for me, gave to me um, over the holidays a few years ago. And this is what I've kept my colors in for years. And so the colors that I carry have kind of evolved, but I've got an assortment of just the colors that I use the most. And also, I also have um, colors that are in testing a lot of times. So while we've been in quarantine, we've been working on a lot of new colors. So I've got a whole bunch in here that are gonna be new. Like we've got, this is pink color that I've been wanting to make for so long. It's a really old synthetic pigment that was actually invented by ceramicists. Mm. And then this one is a new lapis. Oh. So this is lapis lazuli from Chile. And so it's not, Afghani lapis is considered the absolute gold standard, but it's, it's kind of controversial because it comes from areas regulated by the Taliban, usually. So I've been investigating lapis from more ethical sources, but it turns out this is actually a gorgeous blue. It's very different from the Afghani lapis, which is one of the magic things about natural pigments is that it can be, you know, it's called the same thing, lapis lazuli, but because they come from different places all over the world, they have a slightly different geological makeup. And so it will give them kind of a different flavor, like terroir with wine, or like types of heirloom seeds grown in different regions of the country. So. Wow, that's fascinating. So that reminds me of a book I read once. I think it was just called Color. Um, I'll have to look it up and see if I can post a link. Is that one you're familiar with going into the kind of history, like natural history of colors? Yeah, there's one. I think, are you talking about Color, Natural History, The Palette by Victoria Finley? I think so, yeah. Okay, yes, I've definitely read that one. It's got a lot of fun anecdotes. Some of them seem a little speculative, but it was still a really fun read. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, I see a couple of questions, too. One is if lapis will be back in stock, and another is if and when you might be making um, some variations of an art toolkit palette. Um, yes, um, we, we're going to have, basically the store is closed right now with everybody working from home, but we will have lapis when we open up again. So I think probably mid-June we'll have more lapis available, but that's one we don't intend to stop making anytime soon. Oh, but wonderful. We're excited to collaborate with you again for some more of these palettes. I'm not sure if we'll do the, um, the field sketch pocket palette, which is kind of the business card shaped one or, or the Demi palettes next. But yeah. once we're back in the studio, we're really excited to get the ball rolling on <laughs> new versions Stay of these with new colors too. Stay tuned, everyone. And so, so another question that I saw for you 
is if you have um, a favorite color. Oh, it depends on when you ask me. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a different color every day. Generally, I say my favorite color is Vivianite, which is blue ochre. Can you show us what that looks like? That is this one right here. Uh -huh. And so in this light. Oh, Vivianite. Here, I've got it too here. I think um, in the you field sketch palette. I haven't pulled out my water yet. Uh -huh. There we go. So Vivianite is blue ochre. And ours, the ones we use, comes from Australia. But I know they have Vivianite up in Washington that can be foraged. And see, it's such a beautiful mm. kind of moody blue. And it's different from indigo. So, oh, Something. I saw Blush and Blue said she's got that one. I'm glad yeah. you agree. <laughs> Something I love about your paints too, I wonder if you could speak about a little bit, is the properties of painting with um, a natural pigment such as yours, or I'll, I'm also familiar some with the um, the Daniel Smith Prima text, just because I'm also a Daniel Smith fan. Oh yeah, um, they're great. And just that you get so much more beautiful granulation. And also, I feel like in my experience with your paints, they build up this terrific opacity. And I wonder if you might speak a little bit to, to some of the ways that your paints might behave a little differently. If someone is coming to working with like a handmade paint versus, um, I think this is another I did with your palettes, um, versus like a synthetic paint, how they might uh, perform differently. Yeah, they're, they're definitely different. Um, synthetics, they have less variation. They're kind of more homogenized. Um, and so here, let me pull out the lapis. Lapis is natural. Um, it's comprised, lazurite is what gives it the blue, and it's also got, oh, pyrite is in it, and so it can give it kind of this glimmer. And there's a whole bunch of other accessory minerals, is what they're called, that differ from source to source. And so with ultramarine blue, I don't have any in my palette. This is ultramarine violet right here. It is molecularly, chemically, it's the same. It's identical, but they handle very differently. And so as far as ultramarine specifically, this was one of the only natural blues known to history for hundreds of years. And so it's, it's rare, it's very expensive. So when ultramarine blue was invented in France in the 1800s, it was this major breakthrough for the art industry. And because it's pretty cheap to make and it's non-toxic, it's a beautiful, gorgeous blue, but painting with it, while it, depending on what, ultra, what lapis you're using, if you're using an inferior quality lapis, the ultramarine blue will seem really brilliant by comparison, but compared to a really top grade lapis, it's gonna seem kind of flat and the ultramarines, you can see this is kind of shiny. Mm -hmm. It's reflected. There's almost more of a plastic quality to it. And so it'll be different. Like every pigment has its own characteristics, its own way of handling. And that goes for synthetics too. But in general, synthetics are going to be more homogenized. They're gonna have left, less of a differentiation in particle size and differentiation in particle size is what gives you that wonderful opacity. So let's see if I can pull up an example here. I'm trying to remember what colors I used in this one when it just mixed to this near, near black. I think even your Vivianite here, as you start to layer it, goes opaque. Oh, actually, this is, <laughs> this is graphite from you. Yeah, <laughs> which graphite I, is super opaque. I, I love the gray of graphite. I'm a sucker for it. Oh, and it's so shiny. It's like a liquid mm -hmm. pencil. It's fun. It's like those, because the particle sizes are larger, that's what causes granulation, because the larger particles will settle down into the kind of divots, especially of more textured watercolor paper, whereas the smaller particles, which generally are lighter in color, will settle on kind of the peaks of the watercolor texture. So it gives it, yeah, that kind of granulating effect. Yeah. And, and also, I think it, gives it makes a real, it a lot uh -huh. easier to lift because the larger particles, when you use your lifting brush, like here's my favorite lifting brush. This is from Rosemary and Company. Oh, it's so cute. I they call one. it the <laughs> eradicator. The eradicator. That is so beautiful. 
Oh my goodness. And so it's like when you have really, really fine particles, they work them, their way down into the paper fibers and that's what creates kind of a staining effect. So it's really difficult to lift out more often synthetic pigments. And so, so I'm, uh, uh -huh. and someone asked a question um, I posted on Instagram, um, if anyone had any questions. And one was, if you ever use any other paints other than your own, or it sounds like in your, in some of your formative, um, just art studying years you did. Yes, I started out with the classic Prang set. That was the one that I learned on way back in the day. And then um, once I started learning the difference between artist grade and student grade, I really fell in love with Daniel Smith pigments. And let's see, Sennelier is another wonderful one, Windsor and Newton. So I was using all of those, Schmincke. And I kind of was choosing favorites from different lines, putting them in my set. But I realized as I began to sell my own artwork that just like when I was a sculptor or painting and building my own canvases, I wanted to build these from the ground up. And also there were pigments that none of the big companies were making, like salatinite. You couldn't, no one was producing a salatinite watercolor. And so I was like, well, if I want to use it, I'm going to have to make it myself. And then I fell down the rabbit hole. I love that attitude, which I think is, is a real wonderful one for so many artists, which is the DIY of that, like learning the tools and then saying, hey, can I do this myself? And really embracing that. Um, that, that, is, that is so wonderful, Jess. And, uh, and I've seen this, you, I, I haven't gotten to handle one myself, but a couple other things from you. One is, speaking of labor intensive, you carve your own brushes sometimes. <laughs> I do. I actually was just pulling out. My brushes. This is how I'm storing them at the home studio. Oh, so that's and a jar in a in a and with filled with beans. That's brilliant. White beans. It's a little ah uh, beautiful glass. and practical. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, I stole this idea from uh, the people with who store their makeup brushes, usually in coffee beans. But I didn't want the constant smell of coffee, which I'm not drinking right now. <laughs> but this is one of the brushes that's in progress. So it's kind of features a braided design. Oh, someone visited Dakota Art Store in Bellingham. Oh, oh, that's oh, wonderful. That's awesome. I love them so much there. I really miss having Dakota nearby. Oh, that is a gorgeous brush, Jess. Thanks. I don't know where to get started on your process for doing those. It looks so intricate. It's, it takes a while. A brush like this takes me several hours of carving plus more and then you sand it and then there's the finished work to make it waterproof but i started doing this actually as a board kid in my uh, high school classes <laughs> typical art kid at prep school not wanting to hunker down and learn my calculus formative years <laughs> yes. and so pencils the thing is you sharpen them and then they disappear. But paint brushes, they last as long as you take care of your brush, which is really important. They do, they do. Yeah. And um, I just think customizing your supplies is one of the, I don't know, wonderful things you can do as an artist because this type of thing, it doesn't really affect my work, but it affects the joy with which I create my work. Oh, I love that so much because the more we use things, the more kind of an extension of us they become and, and sort of part of the journey. And, and I really experienced that with the art toolkit before every trip kind of tinkering with my tools and developing them and they, they just become that extension. Oh, I love seeing your tools, Jess. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, sure. I, I actually have a question about kind of the customizations that you've developed um, I was looking at some pictures of the sets that you took, I think, on your most recent expedition. You had a warm and a cool set. Oh, yeah. And I was curious how you kind of arrived at that. I'm always, you know, face a trip with such trepidation because I'm so afraid of forgetting something or trying <laughs> out a new idea when I don't have my studio to fall back on. Let me grab those palettes. Let's see. I was just playing. Oh, these aren't quite them. Let me go grab one more thing. I was playing with some ideas. Oh, 
Oh, when maybe you're I shouldn't Boulder? mention this, but I'm I'm tinkering with some new palette ideas, but I shouldn't. Oh, uh... <laughs> it's in development. Yeah, the warm and cool. I really enjoy the warm and cool because for me, a lot of my mixing is oriented around um, mixing neutrals predominantly. I don't work with a lot of pre-mixed greens, so I have a few I really like. Um, because okay, I mean, yeah, I was wondering about the greens in particular. It's like she has none, does she? Do <laughs> well, these were also developed for Alaska. Uh, so I was in a place ah. with very little green. So working with um, the earth tones. And I really find that though there's specialty greens that I just adore. I mean, especially like, you know, your Malachite. There, there's one with Daniel from Daniel Smith I'm more familiar with as well. Um, and now I'm going to get the name wrong. Is that um, Serpentine? No. Oh, is it Serpentine? Genuine's one. Oh, That's I'm going to have to look one. it up. It, it like granulates into this beautiful brown and green speckled. Um, and it's pretty. really beautiful. But I enjoy the, the layout of this for, for organizing my thoughts. And, and, you know, I think the the layout of a palette so you learn kind of by instinct where your colors are is really helpful. And even the palette we developed, I really enjoyed having, you know, some of the variations of each color that split primary warm and cool. Mm -hmm. um, um, Jess, I saw one more question uh, for you about um, if you might speak to like the to toxicity of paints at all, watercolor paints, have any opinions sure. or experiences to share there? Yeah. Um... Especially, I mean, there are different toxicity levels with paints. Uh, cadmium is known to be toxic. In fact, Europe's been trying to ban cadmium. And, you know, cobalt is another one you definitely don't want to ingest. Yeah. And then as far as the natural pigments, there are some that are extremely poisonous, like um, Realgar, Oh, Cinepar. I'm going to interrupt you one second. People sure. are nailing it. Green Appetite Genuine. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if it was that one. I saw, I saw the comments too, and I was like, I bet that's it. So yeah, was, yeah. Go Appetite, ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Serpentine are also pretty. Um, so yeah, then there's, oh, of, the, of the naturals, especially the red, orange, yellow, like Realgar, Orpiment, and Cinnabar, you don't see those anymore, even though they're beautiful light fast pigments because one of them is a mercuric sulfide, so mercury issues. And then the other one is an arsenic issue. And so if used properly, it can be argued that you know, you're just fine, but especially with watercolors, when you have them in your sketchbook like this, you know, you close your sketchbook, and what I've noticed is you can have a very fine powder collecting right down the middle. And so you don't, you really don't want to inhale that or ingest it. Again, it's like, it's, you'd have to probably ingest quite a lot of it to be a problem, especially with ones that have copper. Those are considered, most people don't worry about those because you'd have to have a lot of copper in your system for it to be a problem. And some people consider a little bit healthy. Um, so it's just really good to be aware of what you're using. And especially in the handmade market, you really want to be aware of what people are doing. I've seen some people, you know, label, label paints vermilion. And I don't know if it's real vermilion and they just don't know what they're using or if it's a synthetic vermilion. Mm -hmm. With paints, there is no real standardization in naming. And so you can have names that are descriptive, like, you know, Bluebird Blue, or you can have names that are reflective of what's in it, like Malachite being made with Malachite. And then there are historical names, like Sap Green, which that's not light fast. There's problems making it. So you still have the name sap green, but it's usually a mixture of light fast pigments. Yeah. And then in addition, you have the hues. So you'll have cobalt blue, which is actual cobalt, which is very expensive, kind of toxic. And then you'll have cobalt blue hue, which is probably a phthalo mixture. So always check the pigment index numbers on your paints and it's just always a good practice to advocate for yourself and be a responsible consumer. Oh, I love that, Jess. And um, I heard you mention too that you used to do oil painting a long time ago, which, which I did as well. And 
uh, is something I appreciate with watercolor versus oils is um, while there are still some toxicity issues to be aware of, I, I really appreciate um, uh, having a break from the fumes and such. And that like we've yes. already talked about the portability and the tradition of watercolors and the, the luminosity. And um, so I think we can all be conscientious for sure. Um, Absolutely. How did you get started? I'm, I've always actually wondered um, when you first came up with the idea to use this size, how did that all <laughs> go and what were you using beforehand? Well, let's go ahead and get started on our demo. And then I would love to chat with you a little bit about that. Um, why don't you describe what we're going to do and explore a little bit? Because we just thought for fun, um, some of the project you've been doing on your Jess Greenleaf account. And I will pull out in my drawer right here some of my ancient palettes and can give, do a little show and tell. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's see. With the, the apple paintings um, here in quarantine, I have just been... I mean, it's such uncertain times, it's so stressful, and painting is one of the things that really relaxes me. And so, so I wouldn't have to really reach for a subject, I chose something classic, an apple. And I usually teach that in workshops too, because it's a beautiful form, the colors are always different, depending on the apple. And so I've been also limiting myself to 20 minutes, because that's an excellent way to get yourself down in the chair, because it's not a half hour, it's not an hour. Pretty much anyone can justify 20 minutes. So you basically and set so, yourself a timer. Exactly. And so you get yourself painting and that's what you get you started. But the 20 minute limit, it forces you to paint in ways that you wouldn't if you just had all day. And so it will force you to try more rapid brush strokes, take more chances. And also it shifts the focus from the finished product to the process, which is truly where the joy is. So many people walk away from art because they focus only on the finished product. They think my painting sucks or that's ugly, but it's like, that is beside the point. Well, so, your work seems more than maybe others as well, even more just imbued with the process, the process of making the paints, the process of carving your brushes. And, and I love that and just reminding you know, one of my mantras is trust in process. So once you have a process, but getting started on your process will lead somewhere, leads down that path of, of, of joy and, and discovery. Exactly. It's like you can spend all day planning, you can get real cerebral about it. But once you start taking action, there's a kind of conversation that happens between you and your supplies and the subject. And it's, it's almost like improv. And so you've been painting from pa with paintings of apples as inspiration too, which I think is kind of a sweet, sweet, funny way to do it. And, and your reason behind that? One, I was out of fresh apples. Very practical. <laughs> another one is it's different from using um, an apple sitting in front of you working from life or working from a photograph because you are working from someone else's artistic interpretation of an apple. And they will inevitably make different decisions than you would have. They'll use colors in different ways, brush strokes in different ways. And so kind of it's a wonderful way to step into another artist's shoes for a few minutes, see the world through their eyes, you know, paint with their brush. And you kind of, you'll come away with getting them in your fingers a little bit. It's important to not ever sell the work you create as a direct result of someone's art and I, I don't think you should show it without crediting the original person because they've gone to the trouble of the original translation from life using their own unique filter. It's like you can use it as inspiration, but if it's too close, that becomes an ethical dilemma. I love that. Um... And I agree, there's so much to be learned with using others for inspiration and exercises. And I think this period is such a terrific one for exercises. Um, as, we, as we sketch a little, Jess, I wonder if you can share um, maybe a couple more stories of your pigments. Like, is there a pigment with like the craziest story or a foraged one? Like, do you ever forage <laughs> for your own pigments? And um, a little bit, just, I feel like every pigment must have a story of your explorations. Could you share a little bit around one or two? Oh, sure. 
I've definitely foraged for pigments before. Um, you get less consistent results with the ones that you forge for. They tend to not be quite, they don't have quite the value range or intensity. Can you describe um, foraging for pigments too? Like I'm imagining you walking along a river and like collecting some mud or being up in the mountains and collecting some rocks. Literally, exactly uh -huh. that. I love it. Okay. <laughs> um, so where we lived in Bellingham, it was right up against uh, the Chuckanut Mountains. And there was a creek that ran behind the house and it was just, you know, open forests and rolling foothills. So beautiful. And in the creek, I would find different bits of ochres and different colored earths. And I'd take a handful back to the studio, dust it off, clean it up, and take it for a spin as paint. And so you kind of get to see when you do that, there's upsides and downsides. It's a wonderful way to learn the process pretty cheaply, just with kind of what you have on hand. I mean, that's how art started, was dirt on cave walls. Um, but it's hard to like paint and think at the same time. <laughs> I, get, I get lost and in my I should order. mention you found a really nice inspiration that we posted on Instagram from um, another wonderful artist, um, Patty Trossel, um, who we've credited. And so we're using some of the same inspiration here as we're both painting the background. Exactly. So yeah, anyone painting along with us is probably using that painting. Yeah, her work is absolutely lovely and we're both starting with those bigger shapes so so in forging pigment is this something that like say people might do with anything at home in exploring like making their own small pigments would you have any sort of inspiration or advice for people if people are interested in learning paint making you can try with any dirt you find that you think is a fun color um, and you can start with that you can make it you know, smaller particles in a mortar and pestle. So like go to your garden, dig up some dirt, grind it up. Exactly. So you go out and you find something dusty, look for something soft. If you try, you know, a rock like granite, you're probably going to break your mortar and pestle. And so in geology, there's the Mohs hardness scale. And so if you look into that a little bit, it will just tell you that there's a huge variety in how dense and hard different rocks are going to be. You know, some are clays, some are minerals. There's just a huge variety of what you can find outside. And so there's two things to watch out for when making your own paints at home. Um, you want to be aware that they, they might not be light fast. And so if you're creating work that you intend to sell, it would be good to do a light fastness test just so you are selling something that's going to stand the test of time. It's for the sake of your own reputation and your customer's happiness. And another the kind of wild card is there are such thing as toxic minerals out there. There's radioactive minerals. There's the ones like I mentioned earlier, mercury. Those are very uncommon, but it's still good to be aware. And if you're working with a lot of dust, you'll want to wear a dust mask for sure. Oh, that's great advice. And what, what about too, like coffee or beets? I feel like I'm always staining my cutting board with beets or even strawberries. Oh, yeah. Is that something that you have ever played with or recommend? People... I've messed with it a little bit. I haven't played with it much just because since it's not light fast, I ah. tend to be kind of a light fastness snob a little bit, but just, I also like hoarding my work. <laughs> so. so the minerals are literally rock fast because uh, I said rock fast, light <laughs> fast because they're, they're rocks. They're, uh... <laughs> exactly. And so it's like, they've been out in the sun, some of them for a long time. Not all of them are light fast. Um, some will, you know, change when they're exposed to light. Um, some will change over a long, long time. Some will change quickly, but that's why you can't make a paint out of like flower petals as much as I really wish we could, how I long to make an iris purple. Oh, Wouldn't that just be the best? And so but they fade. To, um, I'm just thinking more about like little experiments. Is there like, if I went to my kitchen right now, anything I might play with to add to, I'm just imagining going to the beach now, my ground up, <laughs> ground up pigment? 
For the sake of just like painting exercises and the joy of making things in painting, yeah, you can use um, a good way to research that is natural food dyes. So you can use like spirulina mm -hmm. in a mix, beet juice, coffee is a wonderful one. There's some people on Instagram that do beautiful work with coffee paintings. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, what else is staying? Cabbage can make some wonderful things. If you get into natural dyeing, there's a whole world of colors that you can make with plants. Very seductive world. I have to try not to get sidetracked by it pretty much <laughs> constantly. <laughs> Oh, well, thanks for sharing your ideas there. That is so much fun. And especially I think about, you know, having having kids projects where that satisfaction of making something from scratch um, is such a it's, learning and fun. And Yeah, one of the fun things to do is you can take kids down to a creek. A creek bed is a great find, a great place to find some just different colored natural earth and rocks. And so if you use find like a larger wet stone and rub the rock back and forth that you find you'll see what color it can make you'll also see if it's soft enough to make anything and so just drawing on rocks painting rocks you know crushing up anything that you can find leaves or different things like that using different fruit juices it's like that's a really fun way to use non-toxic supplies kind of that you make at home as if you do juice on paper yeah i just like see that. a question like what about fruits or like blueberries and that sounds mm -hmm. like up, the, up that alley mm -hmm. yeah just a lot of those the color's going to change pretty quickly mm -hmm. um so it's it's fun for just kind of a daily activity there's just kind of a different line where different rules apply if you're going to be selling your work or if you want it to last a really long time can can I ask you a question of like what are some tests you run your pigments through as you're like designing a new color because yeah. I, you you have really high standards. <laughs> yes. Um a good one to do is make um paint out like a number of different colors like if I wanted to use this guy right here. Let's say, you know, it's just one row of colors that I was doing. Mm -hmm. Paint those out like a, just a swatch of color it doesn't have to, you know, be any special shape and then cut it down the middle and put one half in a drawer make sure no light touches it and put the other half up in your window that's mm -hmm. a really great way to do a home light fastness test and so wait in summer months are better it depends on where you live if you're closer to the equator or in drier warmer climates you're going to get more intense sun so you'll be able to do the test faster but you know a test that lasts one two three years then if you go back and put them next to each other, you'll see very quickly which ones are light fast and not. You also see like if you do a Google image search on, you know, student grade paints, light fastness test, you'll see why people don't make masterpieces with, you know, Crayola or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you can see a big difference there. Wonderful to learn with though. I should show you, I wonder if I've got it handy. Oh, I don't think I've got my color chart. I always like to make a chart of my paints to see how opaque they are over a black line or how easily they lift. That's another yes. little exercise I like. And That's I'll, to, I'll have to post a picture of it. <laughs> so I have to wait for my apple to dry. I'm working on a little heavier paper. I tend to work on 140 pound watercolor in my studio. What are you working on? I'm working on Hanamule. Oh! So this is just, it's a slightly larger one than your zigzag. This is kind of the pocket version. Um, but it's, the paper, it's more of a, it's not quite a hot press, but close. And this one, I'm not sure. I assume your zigzag book is the same. I think so. And it's heavy enough in my zigzag. I can actually paint on both sides too, which I've really enjoyed. You can see it ripples a little bit. Like these are the pages I've painted on so far. There's a little bit of ripple, but honestly, for a sketchbook, that's not bad. No, that's not bad at all. I don't tend to do super heavy washes either. I use oh. tiny brushes, do tiny paintings. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm such a wash person, but then it means I have to be patient. <laughs> do you ever use a hair dryer? I've seen some people. I do. I do. I don't like loud noise very much. So next to my studio desk, I actually have my some like giant earmuffs. 
earmuffs. So I've got my giant oh. earmuffs and then my like little hair dryer. So if I do, I wear earmuffs. But that I means I get startled easily by my family if I leave my earmuffs on and I'm like rocking out to music. <laughs> so then I'm definitely in my own little world when I paint sometimes. <laughs> I love that. Um, I just saw another question about if you are, um, maybe I'll start another version of this, working with any, if people are playing with pigments for fruit, do you have any advice if people might add anything to um, that pigment to help make it more light fast? Is that There's nothing you can really add to it to make it light fast. Um, the additions that you make when making paint are really about adhesion to the paper. There's other um, additives that you can use, like granulation medium. You can add oxgall, which is a dispersant. So for some colors, they kind of want to clump together or flocculate, like our Mayan colors really want to kind of stick together. Other colors you see will kind of do this wonderful spread. Thing. And so you can add alcohol or ox skull, and they will help with that spreading effect. Um, so there's kind of different things you can add that will affect handling, but not so much the light fast. That's just, it really has to do with the pigment itself. Um, I've got another question too around, as an artist working with natural pigments, um, and we've talked about this a little bit before, Jess, do you find yourself using, I guess, does it encourage kind of your artistic eye some as you follow kind of the lead of the pigments you have versus just trying to paint exactly what you see? Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. And kind of, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the kind of working with what you have versus, you know, aiming for that exact match or... <laughs> Oops, you still there, Jess? Oh, my audio just went out. Jess, I just lost you. I don't know if people can hear me. I wonder if we should pause. And um, I think we might just have to re-log on because I think we've lost you. Um, so we'll just jump back on and um, I'll pause a moment. Okay, yeah, it looks like we've got me, but not just okay thanks everyone um let's see again i'll just see if i can reinvite just i wonder okay everyone i'm gonna end quickly and then hop back on and see if i can reinvite just or get her audio back um darn be patient everybody thank you Right, just seeing if we can get dressed back on. Waiting for Jess. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Hi, Jess. Hey, Maria. Sorry. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, I don't know happened. what happened there. We had an audio glitch happen. 
I'm I'm not the best with modern technology, so let's oh, just well, say it was my fault. <laughs> we've got you now. <laughs> um, and I'd asked you a question, and then our audio went, and I got distracted what I'd asked you. Oh, oh, about the process, the creative process of working with, like, some natural pigments versus, um, um, uh, like, a, just synthetic, like, some of the, um, if they kind of push you creatively to, to ex you know, a different creative path. Yeah, definitely. Um, because one of the best things I think to do is when you get it like a new palette of paints is to paint out all your colors, like what you were just saying about a color chart, because mm -hmm. each color really has its own personality. What I mean by that is like different behaviors, like some are going to have larger particles, some are going to have smaller, some are going to flocculate, others are going to want to disperse, some are going to have a really intense tinting strength, while others like, you know, green earth is... It's so gentle, and I, I like to call them shy, kind of give paints personality attributes because it helps mm -hmm. me kind of personify them a little bit. Um, and so I feel like working with synthetics, they, they do have a different behavior, and so it'll change how you handle the paint and, in effect, kind of change your painting. So do you have any favorites? that you've gotten real attached to lately? In terms of pigments? Yeah. Oh, I do. I'm such a big fan of blues. I mean, just even playing with that, your Vivianite, that sort of thing, like just really pulls at my heartstrings of being so subtle. And, um, and, and I guess one thing I often do is work from images black and white if I'm using a photo reference, because then I really oh, can focus on the values and release myself from the expectation of how something should look based on like a photograph or, you know, what my phone has recorded or my printer kicks out. So that's, um, that's one tool I do is I like make studies and things. Uh, and uh, do you usually start your paintings with a value study like that and then paint over? Um, so what I usually do, my process is starting on a small scale, doing value sketches. They'll, they'll even just be in a little notebook. And in fact, someday I will, I will show this. I have these big binders that are basically like my recipe books for, <gasps> um, for paintings. So I can open it up and like look at my notes and colors. That's probably for another demo. <laughs> <laughs> oh I've got, wow! I've got yeah. years of paintings um, with my notes in there, so then I can look back on them. Um, so that that's a little bit of my process that I do. And so is that kind of how you record colors, so you can remember what you used? Exactly. So if I'm working in a series, and maybe I take a break from the series and then go back, I can say, "Hey, this worked really well. Can I push that in another direction?" Um, because I one reason I really love your paints and. Um, is that they do granulate. I'm really drawn to the textures and how paints will sit, you know, in like a heavier watercolor paper, the um, pigments will kind of fall into the grooves, creating when you're up close, this beautiful sort of speckling um, that's really subtle, but I think gives the paintings um, a wonderful texture, especially as I'm mixing grays. I feel like it really gives me these lively grays. Oh, and cool. I see your pigments really shining there with these like grays that are so, interesting to look at. It's interesting with certain pigments, I feel like they really have a mind of their own. Mm -hmm. And so it can kind of force a control freak to sit back and let the paint do its thing. Like um, violet hematite is one of those where it can be really hard to control. It wets really quickly, has a really wide value range, extreme tinting strength. And so it can be hard to pull back and control, but also another factor to it is that it has some interesting variegation qualities, meaning it like will express itself almost as a number of different colors, even though it's a single pigment paint. Like it can look kind of like purple ochre, it can have some plum overtones, some kind of gray undertones. And so it's, it can be really difficult to work with, but it's one of those where I love to see where it will take a painting and how it will push me. Oh, I love that. I love that. 
what do you have kind of in the works now? I know that things are a little bit on pause with the quarantine, but um, do you have anything that you might share? I know you were doing a little bit of teaching and um, yes. And we have workshops set up currently for this summer. Um, we're teaming up with Lindsay Bugby of the Postman's Knox. She's a calligraphy instructor and I'm so excited about them, but we're, we're kind of just in limbo waiting to see what happens with the pandemic. Absolutely. So if anyone is um, registered for those, or anyone who's uncomfortable with the idea of traveling now, I'm happy to give refunds. But as of right now, they're, they're still on, but we're just, we're waiting to see what's going to seem safe. And maybe you can think about online classes. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not much for the technology, but I'm, I'm starting to think about that just, just as a different option. You've started doing that, though. And I have. And actually, I just um, I announced a new series um, on my website at arttoolkit.com. There's a new learn page. And so I think I've got a few spots left in another atmospheric landscapes and cloudscapes focusing on clouds and then glazing and masking so if anyone wants to check them out um i think there's there's still space now and would love to have you join me and um uh just uh, happy to give you support there any way i can i i've been so appreciative of just the whole arts community during this period and um and getting to work with artists like you jess and um and connect with people this way um oh and i i just see a question about these brushes this is the um, I really love the Rosemary Travel Brushes for sketching. This is the R9 Squirrel. This one is out of stock currently. Rosemary's just waiting on some materials, but it has this great big well of water. And Jess, I know you've used um, and are fans of Rosemary as well. They're uh, wonderful brushes, and it's a wonderful company too. <laughs> oh, they're such great people. And this one, I actually just got a whole new batch of these on my website. This is this great synthetic that they... Um, make called the R10 and it's super springy like a size 8 and I've just it's versatile less expensive and and really beautiful and then I have one more in stock right now that I haven't pulled out for this demo yet but um it's this rigor brush and to me it reminds me of a bit of my Sumi brush collection which um I'll have to show you another time I have a wall full of brushes hanging next to me <laughs> oh I'd be so curious uh, to see oh my goodness I'll have to show you <laughs> Um, and Jess, you've got a mailing list. So if people want to hear about what's coming, they can sign up and you're still sending out updates, I think. Yes, I think the next newsletter is going to go out next weekend. And that's going to have a lot of info about kind of our status right now. Um, our, all of our employees are working from home right now, but we're we're going to update the shop pretty soon. We actually have a couple new products that we've been making in quarantine. Oh. And this prompted us to pivot a little bit so we can keep feeding everybody work. Um, so we are going to have a sketchbook out for the first time. Woo! I'm very excited. It's going to be a Japanese style. Um, it's kind of like an accordion, but a little different. Oh, I can't wait to see I'm really exciting, uh, excited the, the girl who's making them, Alea. She hiked the entire PCT this summer and she is also a bookbinding master. She studied paper making in the Czech Republic and we feel so fortunate to have her working with us. And so she is the one who is heading up the bookbinding. We've been prototyping together for a while. And she was just showing me the very first ones that she's finishing this week. So I'm hoping that we'll have those available in the next couple of weeks. They're all going to oh. be made with Arches paper. So they'll be delicious. So for sure, sign up for your, your mailing list because things tend to go really fast if I've seen one thing <laughs> on your website. <laughs> <laughs> it does happen that way sometimes. <laughs> it's over on purpose. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so exciting. Um, and uh, I just saw one last question that um, maybe we'll wrap up with this in just I'm um, wondering if you might have any other sources for some inspiration, like a couple, um, any other art books or something where people want to go and learn a little more. I know you've got some inspiration just on your website, but do you have any, any last thoughts to share and in diving into this world a bit of pigments and color and uh, where um, they come from or painting and such? For, for learning, if you're just curious to kind of learn more about the, the wonderful world of pigments, 
There is a delightful book that came out in the last couple of years called The Secret Lives of Color. And that one, it's got a lot of just fun backstories about color and culture, historical pigments. You know, one example of a crazy historical pigment would be mummy. People literally ground up old mummies to make a brown. <laughs> um, so it profiles different colors like that. Um, it's a fun place to learn. And as for a fun watercolor book for now, I really like Samantha Dion Baker's Draw Your Day. Yes. That one kind of rescued my painting practice. I was just feeling kind of overwhelmed for a while. And some of her ideas helped me lighten up and give me new direction. I just thought it was a really a fun book. Oh, I love that and highly recommend that as well. Um, well, gee, I think I've got an apple close to completion and I love yours too, Jess. <laughs> I keep getting distracted while I'm working and so it's not coming along quite the, <laughs> the same way if I wasn't busy jabbering. Oh, but I just, I want to, I want to thank you so much, Jess, for your time in joining, joining me to paint today and to talk and share all of your experience and insight on color. I just think the work you do is, is just marvelous and that you're, a mix of artists and chemist geologists and the knowledge you've been accumulating around how all these, these minerals and, and materials interact. And I appreciate you um, sharing them with all of us. And, and I'll just say briefly to everybody, I'll um, see if I can do just a brief follow-up post with a couple notes that the two books we mentioned, The Secret Lives of Color is what Jess just talked about. And then another one we mentioned is Color, a natural, I believe Natural History by Victoria Finley. Um, Natural history of the palette, yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you. Well, and thank well, you so much for having me today. This was such a wonderful idea. You're definitely pushing my, my comfort zone with actually getting on camera. So <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, though. No better way to learn. <laughs> well, we'll talk soon. And everybody, I hope you have a great weekend. Absolutely. Thanks again, Maria. Yeah, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.